Um, so I'm going to talk about um, polysaccharide and conjugate vaccines. And because it's the session after lunch, I've, I've tried to take out most of the data slides so that there's a lot of pictures and a lot of cartoons so that but some of you are going to fall asleep um, and will be named during the lecture while you're asleep. And um, so, so to make you try and keep you awake, I'm just going to do rather pictures and concepts rather than lots and lots of heavy data. There will be some data, but not, not too much. Um, and here's the first picture, which uh, is many of the bacteria that uh, we encounter as humans, which have around them a bacterial capsule. And so that's why this lecture, and, and that's why this lecture is on, on, the, on the circuit, because we have so many different vaccines that are either already have been made, already licensed, poor vaccines that have been improved on, or indeed some pathogens here where we're trying to find uh, a new vaccine that for the first time can be used in humans. And what all of these pathogens here have, they all have a bacterial capsule, and that's why they're uh, so important. And what I'm going to do in the... Um, during the talk um, is I'm going to first of all talk a little bit about the biology of encapsulated vaccines and the, and the role of the capsule. Then I'm going to talk about some natural and vaccine-induced immunity experiments uh, to the capsule, uh, and that'll take us into why they're not very good on their own and why we need to develop and understand the immunology of conjugate vaccines. Um, I'm going to talk about the impact of carriage because that's really, really important for understanding how these vaccines can have maximal public health impact. And then I'm going to talk about immunosenescence, which is um, the senility of the immune system. Um, and that's not necessarily for you, but more for the lecturers who you've already heard talking, who are approaching that part of their lives now where they, they need a little bit of help, me included. And the three bacteria that I'm going to focus on at the beginning are Haemophysium lizabii, pneumococcus, and meningococcus. And that's because I'm a pediatrician and um, grew up studying these organisms and trying to understand why these three pathogens are so important in early life, and then with age on the x-axis here, and then largely disappear as pathogens until, for pneumococcus, you get to your 50s and 60s, and for meninge, that one period of your life when you're 18, 19, 20, and you get a, a peak in meninge. And you're going to hear about more of these vaccines individually, but I'm going to try and talk more conceptually about them. And so um, these three that I'm going to focus on are obviously very different. You've got two uh, gram negatives, which I've highlighted in red, and a gram positive. They can see they have different shapes, but what they share is a capsule around them. So this capsule is really, really important. Now, if you look at the structure of the capsule, this is Haemophilus influenza B, and this is pneumococcus. So the sugars are completely different. But the clue to why we talk about them and think about them in a similar way is the N number. Because when they form a capsule, what they do is they form very long chains. So Haemophilus influenza B capsule is hundreds and thousands of these sugars all in a linked molecule. And here's an example of what a cartoon of a pneumococcal capsule looks like. So this structure, these long chains of polysaccharide, is what is why we can talk about all these things together. And I'll explain to you in a few moments why, how they interact with the immune system that gives them all a similar characteristic. But what we know and what we use the capsule most for probably is typing. So the reason we know that there are several different Haemophilus influenza types is because there's subtle differences in the structure of the capsule between the different Haemophiluses, between the different meninges, and between now probably 100 pneumococcal serotypes. And so we can type these pathogens according to the capsule structure, and we can raise antibodies in rabbits, and then we can identify the different ones. But also, they're a virulence factor. So you know that there are haemophilus that are non-typable, non they don't have a capsule, and they don't tend to cause a major problem in human health because they are susceptible to killing, unless you have bad lungs or whatever, and then they do cause it, or you have problems with your ear and they cause otitis media. But in general, if you don't have a capsule, you don't survive. And the reason you don't survive is that the capsule is anti-complementary. So it stops the binding of complement, which are proteins that can punch holes in bacteria and cause the bacteria to die, or indeed proteins that bind to antibody and can cause uh, uh, them to die. But as uh, uh, kind of strangely, they're also, these capsules, target for protective antibody. So it's a really a little bit of a conundrum why that should exist. And the reason is that when an antibody binds to capsule, because the antibodies I have here, complement receptor sites, they allow the antibody to accept complement. And then what happens is the proteins can come together and they can punch a hole in the bacteria on their own, which is what happens with meninge. Or the antibodies here and the complement can recruit into them new cells such as phagocytic cells, which bind the complement receptor, 
bind the antibody, and together they eat up the pneumococcus. And you'll see an example of that towards the end of the talk. And you can measure various aspects of these of this cartoon. You can measure the antibodies binding to capsule. You can measure opsonophagic acidosis, where you have a neutrophil, and you can set this up artificially. But for meninge, all you need to do is measure the serum bactericidal activity, because just antibody and complement is enough to kill the, um, the, the, the meningococcus. And so these kinds of assays, before people really understood in great detail what was killing and what was protecting, um, those serum bactericidal activity assays were used in population studies trying to understand what might underlie the susceptibility to meningococcal disease, and this is children, if I remember correctly, being admitted to hospital. And so what you can see here with age on the x-axis, and the red is the peak of admissions to hospital for meningococcal disease around the first, second year of life, and in gray is serum bactericidal activity in the blood, which initially comes from the mother, disappears, and you can see is inversely correlated with protection. So at this point, when these studies were being done, they didn't know that much about what it was in the serum bactericidal activity, what it was killing, but they knew, for at least for meninge C, that the target was polysaccharide. And so early attempts to prevent meningococcal infection were all based on, anti on, on vaccines that were polysaccharides. And these are very limited vaccines. And here's a beautiful example of the limitation of meningococcal C polysaccharide vaccine, which in this case is being used to treat an outbreak in Quebec. And the effectiveness of the vaccine in kids of six years of age, two to five years of age, or under two. And so there was an outbreak, so they took kids and they immunized them at these various ages, and then they looked to see if there was vaccine effectiveness and for how long that vaccine effectiveness lasts. What was the vaccine effectiveness for the first two years after vaccination and for the three to five years after vaccination? So for the oldest children who got a single dose, there was good efficacy in the first two years, 95%, but you can see that dropped to 77, and the confidence interval cross zero, so that was essentially not significant, but the point estimate was still there, but dropping. For the two to five-year-olds, you can see the point estimate was 62% in the first two years, but there also the confidence interval, it, the confidence intervals uh, cross zero, so that's not statistically significant, and then no efficacy at all, slightly later. And then for kids under two, there was no evidence of protection. So that's just an illustration in real life without having to do anything with mice or rabbits or hamsters that shows you that these polysaccharides are not particularly good and for meninge, particularly under the age of two, provide no protection at all. So you need an alternative. So lots of vaccines were developed and some are still available based on the capsule polysaccharide, but they all have a similar limitation, which is that you generally have a poor antibody response in young kids. Not, not, not always completely absent, but not particularly functional. And they all provide a short duration of protection for reasons that we'll come to in a moment. So these have largely been superseded. These are historical now. Haemophysis is historical. Typhoid is still available. And 23-valent pneumococcal polysaccharide is still available. But we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. So the reason that these long sugars, we can talk about them as a single group of antigens in the context of the immune system, is because they're long, and they have repeated sugars, they are able to cross-link on their own two immunoglobulin receptors on the surface of a B cell. So when we develop as humans, we develop a, a group of B cells that are able to recognize, before they've ever encountered an antigen, we develop a group of B cells that are able to recognize types of molecules because we need some immunity even when we've never been exposed to a pathogen before. If we didn't have that, we, we, we wouldn't survive as a race. And so one important class is the sugars. And so we develop with B cells that have never, ever seen an antigen. We develop B cells that have the ability to recognize sugars like this. It's not a very good recognition, but they're able to produce IgM on encounter with this. The IgM isn't very strongly binding, doesn't have very high affinity, but it can in some cases produce protection. And so when you encounter polysaccharide and you're naive, a B cell responds and it makes polysaccharide-specific antibody. But as I've hinted, this is rather limited. So I said below the age of two, it's particularly below the age of one, and some you do make some responses to polysaccharides, but they're not very functional. We don't know why that is. I'm not going to go into that today. The isotype, in other words, the immunoglobulin G that they make, is also very restricted. You do actually get a little bit of switching of B cells, even if you don't have T cells around, and, and these switch a little bit to IgG2, but it's rather limited. And then, very importantly, there's no evidence of memory. So when you get just a polysaccharide interacting with a B cell, it stimulates the B cell to make antibody, but there's no immune memory. So that's a problem. And then 
not relevant for today, but if you give multiple doses of a polysaccharide vaccine, you can see sometimes the antibody level each time goes down and down, and we call that hyper-responsiveness, but that's not particularly relevant for today. So, like many things in science, you know, people have really discovered them way, way uh, before you discover them, but haven't necessarily exploited them. It was in the 1920s that really that they realized that if you took this synthetic sugar and you conjugated it to a serum globulin, a protein, you could make these synthetic uh, molecules immunogenic in rabbits. And that's the basis for conjugation of, of uh, conjugate vaccines. And so if we use the earlier example, here's a, a polysaccharide. And if you take that polysaccharide, either the full length or you can cut it up into small pieces and attach it chemically onto a protein carrier, this is what a conjugate vaccine essentially is. And this vaccine interacts with the immune system completely differently to just if you uh, give it polysaccharide. So there's the sugar. And, of course, what you're trying to do is you're trying to stimulate antibody. Because I've already shown you that antibody is the basis for protection against encapsulated bacteria, not necessarily T cells. Um, and so you want to have enough sugar on the protein carrier so that the B cell that you're interested in is a B cell that's going to make antibodies to the sugar. Now, of course, when you immunize with a conjugate, you also get B cells that recognize the protein. So we use tetanus toxoid or the toxoid. So you actually get tetanus responses with the responses as well. And if you have too much carrier, you get problems as well. But if it's an optimized vaccine, many of the B cells will make an antibody to the sugar. But what people don't really think about with B cells is that they're actually very good antigen-presenting cells. That's why it's really important that the sugar is chemically linked to the protein. Because what they do is when they recognize the sugar, they take in this molecule and then they chop it up, and the protein survives and is expressed on the surface with class II molecules. And what that does is that allows a T cell to come in and start helping the B cell. So this T cell is effectively being fooled, because the T cell here, you can see in orange, is recognizing the carrier molecule. And it actually thinks it's, probably, it thinks it's helping a T cell response. But in fact, it's providing help to the T cell, to the B cell, and is agnostic of what the antigen is. And this T cell help, results in R2 production. That means that CD4 upregulation of some stimulation molecules, which produces R4. And the end product is that the B cell switches from making IgM to making G1, G2, G3, G4, depending on the stimulus. But not only that, but these B cells and T cells interact in germinal centers. And the antibody that comes out of these germinal centers is high affinity. In other words, it binds much more strongly to the antigen of interest than the antibodies that were initially being produced by this B cell through its kind of early, early on recognition. And this is the basis of uh, a T cell help to a, uh, um, to a vaccine. The B cells will come out of the germinal center and they'll live as long-lived plasma cells. Sometimes they live here in the bone marrow and you will, they will be producing antibody over the years and that's what you'll measure in the blood. But very, very importantly for the conjugate vaccines, they also induce memory B cells. And again, because they're in the germinal center, and there's the cytokine help, and the T cells are playing a very, very important role in helping these B cells become memory B cells. And I know that a lot of this is what uh, Claire Ann went over with you, and, and it's deliberate that we do this repetition so that this really is driven home, particularly in the context of conjugate vaccines. And those memory B cells, they will then move out and live in the lymph nodes, in the spleen, up in the upper respiratory tract, in the gut, in the vagina, and other parts of the body where you need to have prime mucosal B cells that are there waiting for organisms that might live on the surface of the body, and they form that primary level of defense. So this is a cartoon of how conjugate vaccines work. Most of it is backed up by evidence, but not all of it, because once vaccines work very well, people are not interested really in the mechanism. They, just, they work well, so they just reproduce them in different models. So one of the things I just want to show you is can conjugate vaccines induce antibody response in very young infants? So infants at birth. So here's a newborn baby girl. This happens to be my first daughter. And, um, you know, you want, to, you want to protect this baby right from the beginning. And so can conjugate vaccines induce antibody in the first day of life? So we worked with colleagues in Kenya, and we did a really simple study. This was at a time when pneumococcal conjugate vaccines had recently been introduced. And we wanted to see if we could protect young babies in the first few months of life. So here's the EPI schedule, 6, 10, and 14 weeks. So some of the babies are randomized to that. And you can see that if you only start immunizing at 6 or 10 weeks, then you're misprotecting a lot of babies who get disease or, or, or get carriage of pneumococcus in this early life. And then to compare, we gave babies a, a dose of vaccine within 24 hours of birth and then 10 and 14. 
But importantly, if you look at the, where we took the blood, we took the blood at birth, and we took the blood in this group before their first vaccine, and in this group after their first vaccine at 10 weeks. And so because we had those two time points, what we were able to do was by measuring this one and this one, we just looked at natural antibody decay. Because here the mother's got the antibody, the baby's got the antibody from their mother. At six weeks, they hadn't yet had a vaccine. So that we could look at the natural decay of antibody to the serotypes in the vaccine. And then here at 10 weeks, because we were taking blood after one dose of vaccine, we were able to look to see at the observed antibody level at 10 weeks and compare it to the predicted at 10 weeks. That was just a very simple way of trying to find out if under this curve, the babies were making some antibody. And so there's seven serotypes in this vaccine. This was the first licensed vaccine for pneumococcus. There's the decay rate that we calculated. And so we were able to measure and look at the difference between the observed and the, uh, um, and the uh, imputed or predicted. And you can see that for all the serotypes, the observed over predictors were greater than one. So they were all making antibody. And look at serotype four. The antibody level is 10 times higher than predicted if you just have this natural antibody decay. So even in the first 24 hours of life, these conjugate vaccines are super, super um, immunogenic and can induce antibody production. And so the first vaccine that was licensed to, uh, a conjugate vaccine that was licensed in humans to prevent infection was Haemophysia influenza B. Um, some of you may be seeing some Haemophysia influenza B disease now, but, but historically in countries with high coverage, this is what happens once you introduce the vaccine. So this is in the UK for the first 10 years after introduction, or maybe slightly less, eight years. We had a little bump over here, and so we introduced a routine booster dose, and now we don't see much hip disease at all in the UK. It's almost completely gone. The second vaccine was licensed uh, as a conjugate was the Menin-C conjugate vaccine, which was first introduced in the UK in 2000. It was licensed just a few months before the first pneumococcal conjugate. So if you follow the um, blue line, I think is men no, the, the yellow line is Men-C. Just look at what happens after you introduce the vaccine to all infants. And you see you hardly get any Men-C disease at all. And I think Shamir's tomorrow is going to talk about uh, meningococcal vaccines in more broadly uh, because we don't have a conjugate for Men-B. That, that, that capsule isn't immunogenic. So very, very powerful when used as a public health intervention. So as I pointed out at the beginning, one of the things about these bacteria, partly maybe even the reason they've evolved with capsules is because they like to live either in the upper respiratory tract or in the gut or in the genital urinary tract. And so they have their capsules there that prevent them from being killed by, um, by, by complement. But also carriage is very important because it underlies how they cause disease. So people have been very interested in whether polysaccharide vaccines can predict, prevent carriage. And here is an example of a very nice study done in the Netherlands by Licker Sanders and her colleagues, where these are older children who have otitis media, who are randomized to get either conjugate vaccine or nothing. And then after, conjugate, after the conjugate vaccine, they go and are given a polysaccharide vaccine with 23 valent polysaccharide. So the ones who don't get any pneumococcal conjugate vaccines, there's no change in their carriage of non-PCV7 serotypes. But the one who get the polysaccharide vaccine booster here, they actually have an increase in the amount of carriage to, of, of serotypes that are not in PCV7. And in this particular study, the main serotypes that they carried were 11A, 15B, and 16. And 11A and 15B are two serotypes which have are in this vaccine, the red vaccine, and which these kids actually responded to very well. These were older kids that had a lot of otitis media. So even if you immunize with a polysaccharide vaccine, you have no impact on carriage. And that's a really, really important uh, um, underlying observation. And if you immunize with a conjugate vaccine, and this is just a meta-analysis of the first year of life and the second year of life, every dot on the left of the lines is where there's been a reduction in carriage to conjugate vaccines. So conjugate vaccines are really, really good at reducing the carriage of the serotypes contained in the vaccine. So in principle, therefore, high circulating IgG following natural exposure or polysaccharide have no little impact on carriage, and conjugate vaccines reduce carriage. So why am I talking about carriage so much? So if you think of this cross-section, apologies if you've just had your lunch, but this is the pneumococcus here in the uh, upper respiratory tract, and usually they live there quite happily. But often if you get a viral infection or something like that, it changes your epithelium, adhesion molecules are exposed, and what happens is the pneumococcus can slide up the eustachian tube and cause the tightest media. 
And there's some really interesting data, and I don't know if Ron will talk about it later, but, you know, during COVID, with everybody isolated, we saw a reduction in invasive pneumococcal disease, despite the fact that carriage remained relatively high. And so a lot of people postulated that maybe it's the viruses that have gone down because everyone's isolated, and because the viruses weren't there, even though the pneumococci were still here, they were unable to go there or down into the lungs, which is where they cause a lot of disease. And pneumococcal pneumonia is obviously a major, major problem. The pneumococcus also gets into the blood, and that's what we usually measure. So invasive pneumococcal disease, and Ron and Keith are going to talk all about preventing invasive pneumococcal disease in the session after this. So this is a, a schema of why carriage is so important, because it all starts here with carriage. If you don't carry in your, in your nasopharynx, you don't really get disease. And so that leads me to this story, which is obviously a very happy set of grandparents coming to visit a relatively newborn baby um, and a toddler. Now, of course, we know that toddlers have a lot of pneumococci in their nasopharynx, and they're not very good with their personal hygiene. And so what happens with toddlers is that they spread their pneumococci to whoever's around them, in this case, the loving grandparents. Now, for those of you who are clinical, you can see his face is red because he drinks a lot. He's got liver disease, and he's high risk for pneumococcal infection. And sadly, I'm afraid to say that as a result of visiting his new grandchild, he unfortunately passes away. Now, I don't want to upset you, so I'm going to bring him straight back. But this is just a cartoon. This did not happen, okay? And the reason it didn't happen is the toddler actually had a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Ah, you see. And so what happened was, this is, this is not, this is autistic license. The conjugate doesn't actually get rid of carriage. It prevents you getting new carriage. And because it prevents you getting new carriage, it essentially blocks you from passing it to your baby, brother or sister, or indeed to your parents or your grandparents. So this is part of the power of conjugate vaccines. And it's the power of being able to Im impact on carriage. Ron and Keith are going to talk about the, the other side of this, but this is, this is one of the reasons why these vaccines have been so incredibly cost-effective because they prevent disease both in the immunized children, those who are too young to be immunized, and adults. And here's an example of this from the UK. Uh, four years after giving, uh, in this case, uh, PCV7, uh, you look at the disease in adults from PCV7, the younger adults and the older adults, and you can see that vaccine disease goes down. They've never seen the vaccine, these individuals. All they are doing is living in a country with a very high coverage. Now, what you can also see is that there's an increase in non-vaccine type disease, and that's what's going to be addressed later on by Ron and Keith, and I'll just mention something about that in a moment. So you can see that this very successful experience of haemophilus influenza B, uh, pneumococcus, meningococcal conjugate vaccines has led to the development of many other conjugate vaccines, and uh, for example, this uh, typhoid vaccine, the first typhoid conjugate vaccine was licensed and WHO pre-qualified in 2018, made by Barrett Biotech. But you notice that the major study of safety and efficacy, in this case in Malawi, was published uh, um, quite a few years after the vaccine was licensed. And the reason for that is that one of the things that we've been able to do with conjugate vaccines is we've been able to pave the way forward for licensing vaccines based on correlates of protection without large-scale efficacy trials. So in this particular case, Bharat were able to bridge to some immunogenicity data that had been generated by a previous conjugate vaccine that was developed by NIH. And they were able to do some studies with the Oxford vaccine group in a human challenge model. And the combination of the bridging to an original study that showed efficacy for a conjugate, which was never licensed, plus the uh, uh, data in the human challenge model meant that this vaccine was licensed. And so now the, you need to go and show that it is truly efficacious with real-world evidence from phase four evaluations. And there, Cathy Neusel is, is coordinating a number of studies around Africa. So it's a huge, a really successful way of getting vaccines licensed more quickly. And Group B strep is another example of a pathogen which has a capsule or several, several different strains with different capsule. It uh, colonizes the genitourinary tract and the rectum. And it, GBS, as you know, causes a lot of problems uh, uh, globally with maternal, fetal, and infant cases and stillbirths and infant deaths. And the pathogenesis is partly that the genitourinary tract is colonized. The baby will be born through the vaginal uh, tract and then will be colonized at birth, which can give you early onset disease, meningitis usually, uh, in the first week of life, or you get a second 
a, a set of infections up to about 90 days of life, so early and late onset disease. So this is a strategy ripe for bacterial conjugate vaccines, but the polysaccharide vaccines aren't able to provide the kind of protection we would like, ideally, because of their immunogenicity. And so the idea would be that if a conjugate vaccine could be licensed for use at, in maternal immunization, then what you could do is you could immunize between the second and uh, in the third trimester. Antibodies would cross the placenta to provide the baby with direct protection, but also some preliminary data suggesting that the conjugate vaccine would prevent some colonization in the mother as well. Now, again, it would be nice to do and license this vaccine on efficacy, but because of the incidence and the recognition of GBS, you'd need about 80,000 mothers randomized to show efficacy for this. That would mean you'd almost have to have every single neonatal unit in Africa involved in an efficacy trial. So there are a number of us who are now working on corridor protection for GBS, trying to prepare regulators and others for accepting a vaccine that might be licensed by, for example, FDA and perhaps pre-qualified by WHO based on corridor protection alone. And like for typhoid, you would then require the phase four evaluation to make sure that it really works. And, and that, that's, that's very active at the moment um, at WHO, uh, FDA, the Gates Foundation funding, and Pfizer have a vaccine that's ready for a large phase three study, which may be a trial where you embed a initial license point based on correlative protection with a subsequent evaluation of if the vaccine is efficacious. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I just want to spend a little time on what I hinted at the beginning, which is more important for the lecturers than for you, which is immunosenescence. So here are two previous lectures on ADVAC. You can see how happy they are to have been on ADVAC. Um, and you can see that I've superimposed this on a graph of the age of individuals and their incidence of invasive pneumococcal disease in the pre-vaccine era. So you can see that as you get older, you have almost as much IPD as, in terms of incidence, as you do in, in young babies. Of course, you get much more pneumococcal disease because there are many, many, many more older people over the age of 65 than they are between the age of one and two. This is a huge problem for people who are older. And the reasons are not entirely clear, but are partly related to the fact that um, you have a essentially a senility of your immune system. So your immune system declines over time. And you can see this very clearly. This is just a study of polysaccharide vaccine in young and old people. And there's IgM responses. And you can see in the, in the triangles that are black and upside down that clearly the old people make a very poor response compared to the young people in terms of just of IgM. So strategies have been required to overcome this. Um, and they have focused on making conjugate vaccines initially for the adult market. And so in 2021, two vaccines were licensed for adults initially. This is the uh, a vaccine made by Merck, which has got 15 pneumococcal polysaccharides. And this vaccine was licensed on immunogenicity alone, again, because of the work that was done before on corridor protection. So what you can see here, the green favors conjugate, the, the blue favors polysaccharide, and this is a head-to-head -head study of PCV15 against PPV23, and the ones to the right are the geometric mean concentrations which favor the conjugate vaccine. So you can see in these individuals, I think this is just the data for the over 50s. Clearly, the conjugate is more immunogenic. This is binding antibody, and then it's the opsonophagocytic antibody. So this was licensed initially for adults in 2021, and then soon after for, for children. And uh, another company that you may have heard of called Pfizer uh, have made a vaccine for 20 valencies. And here, in to their pivotal studies for licensure, they have done a head-to-head -head study for of PCV20 versus the licensed PCV13. And you can see here, the right-hand side favors 13, the left-hand side favors PCV20. But this is the line which you need to be above in order to be licensed. And you can see here that slightly reduced immunogenicity for PCV20 against the serotypes that are shared with PCV13. But on the right are the seven new serotypes in the conjugate vaccine, where only comparator is polysaccharide vaccine. And here you can see that apart from serotype 8, all the serotypes in PCV20 are superior when given to adults than the polysaccharide. And we know that uh, conjugate vaccines prevent pneumonia in adults, a trial in, in the Netherlands. And so this vaccine was licensed in 2021 for use in adults, and we're waiting for the license indication in children. And Ron and Keith, I'm sure, are going to say a lot more about how we might use these in real life. So 
You know, when we immunize adults, you can run the video. When we immunize adults, we focus on antibody levels. But as I've shown you before, for the pneumococcus, you have an important component of the immunity, which is phagocytic cells that have to engulf it. So the way it works with the pneumococcus is if you've had a vaccine, the green is the pneumococcus. That pneumococcus there, the green, becomes opsonized with antibody. And that attracts in a cell. And here in this, in this um, mouse spleen, the cell is the red splenic neutrophil. And you can see how it's attracted to and swallows the pneumococcus. That's how we all fight the pneumococcus. We all kill the pneumococcus like this. Antibody alone is no good. So if you have kids who have no neutrophils, like after a bone marrow transplant, you can give them antibody, but you can't really protect them because they need neutrophils in order to phagocytose. So when we think about the elderly, we don't really think about the other components that you require for protection. All we think about maximizing antibody levels. But you can see that if your neutrophils don't work well, it doesn't matter how much antibody you're going to get, you won't work. You won't be able to protect yourself. And so uh, Helena K2 in Finland uh, uh, did these experiments oh, more than 10 years ago now. And they're very simple. They took Neutrophils from young people and old people, and they gave them antibodies to 6B, the same amount, or 14 or 23F, and they looked to see which ones killed better, and you can see all the young neutrophils killed much better. I've got one more slide, and I'm finished. And so um, Dr. Buchanan, who works in Buffalo, is also thinking about this, and here she shows in her mouse model that you get a similar problem with mice from old mice and young mice. They don't do very well when you're trying to kill the pneumococci. And so what she's done is she's been able to add in adenosine deaminase, and what she's been able to do is restore the function of the neutrophils that come from old people um, by giving them adenosine deaminase. It's kind of like a, almost like a Viagra for, 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 for cells that, that need a little bit of a kick when they want to uh, opsonize and, and phagocytose. So when we think about adult vaccination, we've also got to think about the molecules that help us protect ourselves. Antibodies are one important component, but our expectations maybe for adult immunization need to be calibrated when you're dealing with a mechanism which is largely based on antibody and the cells that interact with antibody. So um, just in summary, um, polysaccharides, I think, remain interesting. Um, they haven't gone away, and I think we're still going to. We need vaccines for Klebsiella, for Shigella, for others, and I think they're all in the pipeline based on conjugate technology. But they're lim the polysaccharides are limited as pure vaccine antigens, and I think I've hopefully convinced you that they make powerful vaccines as conjugates. The, the, the impact of the conjugates is both direct in the babies and also indirect, because this impact on carriage is very, very important. It has a downside, which is replacement carriage, and I'm sure Ron and Keith are going to tell you more about that. Um, but we mustn't forget how powerful they are. As I say, the, the precise mechanism around carriage we don't understand, but because it works so well, we don't study it so well. Um, and then vaccine in responses in the elderly are clearly impaired and better with conjugate vaccines. So there's hope that we can control adult disease as well with conjugate vaccines. Um, so that was my last point about uh, uh, antibody alone might not be enough for adults. And then finally, the lessons from conjugate vaccine experience can inform other vaccines. And a few of us have been working on correlates of protection for COVID as well, trying to accelerate COVID vaccines. But overall, it's been an incredible journey with bacteria over the years that has really gave us, given us fundamental information that has helped the entire vaccine field. Thank you very much. Question. Is it me? Sorry. Hi, I just got a question about um, the data that you have shown in the beginning about the conjugate vaccine induces um, immune responses um, in infants that just after birth. Yeah. And I'm wondering if this is the case, why hasn't that been translated into policy? That's a really good question. Uh, and I would ask the same question. Um, in Africa, Lots and lots of babies aren't born at birth, um, and it's the relative minority of babies that are born in a formal environment. So um, that's, that's, that's one of the reasons. Um, what we also have to do is we also have to try and translate that very early immune response to the vaccine into some form of efficacy. And uh, when we've done the work on the relationship between antibodies and the prevention of acquisition uh, uh, of pneumococci in early life, what we haven't been able to find is an ability of those relatively low levels of antibody to prevent acquisition in early life. Um, and so they also, apart from, you know, BCG, there aren't really uh, at the moment uh, enough of vaccines that are given routinely with a high, high coverage at birth that would make it necessarily a viable way to, to move forward and not interfere 
with what is essentially a, a schedule of vaccine that works, which is the EPI at 6, 10, and 14. You know, we've had EPI for so long. So these kind of disruptive schedules are, have to be thought through very carefully in the round. Um, but there's a biological reason why they might not give you the protection you hope for because the antibody levels aren't high enough. And there's also a reason for not disrupting um, the systems that they are. And the third thing is not all babies are born in health facilities where they could give the, the vaccine. Thank you. I'm asking because WHO and the Gates Foundation are evaluating different vaccine schedules. Absolutely. And, and, and we've, and I'm on one of those committees and, and we have, uh, believe me, I've mentioned my own data, uh, from time to time. Uh, and it has been discussed, but for the reasons I've told you, uh, that's why it's not really at the moment a flavor of the month. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, so if the conjugated vaccines, uh, confer very good, uh, uh memory cells, why then we need boosters for some of those conjugated vaccines? You'd think that you then need boosters. Just one single dose would be enough. Thanks. Yeah. So and that's an important question. Um, so one of the reasons is that there is clearly a threshold of antibody that you require in the blood at the time of exposure, uh, which is likely to give you protection. And this was particularly apparent with meningococcal C. If you have a pathogen that divides very, very quickly, like the meninge, if you have memory but no circulating antibody, you can be dead in the evening if you were exposed in the morning. And we know from uh, accidents in laboratories that that can happen with meninge. So initially in the UK, we introduced meninge C without a booster, routine booster. And then what we did is we found not that we had necessarily deaths, but when we looked at the efficacy, the efficacy at the age of a year, if you only got vaccine in the first few months of life, was already very much reduced. So that booster was required to increase the antibody levels and maintain them longer. And if you give a vaccine to a one-year-old, the antibody persists much longer than if you give a vaccine even two or, th two or three doses to an infant because the immune system matures and by the age of the year is just that much more mature to maintain long-term antibody. And so then it is maintained over that period of vulnerability. So it's essentially, essentially that. Sorry. A uh, question from John, who was online. Um, if the memory B cells stimulated by conjugate vaccines travel to lymphoid tissues like gastrointestinal or tonsillar, do they provide mucosal immunity? The prevention of new colonization seems to suggest so. If Do they provide? Uh, the, the mucosal. Mucosal IgA. Yeah. Uh, yes, they probably do. But um, IgA is one of those molecules that's been studied for many, 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 many years, particularly in Scandinavia, and we still don't really know what it does very well. There isn't really a kind of example par excellence where IgA is the molecule of choice for protecting you. You can give a vaccine for rotavirus, for polio, for all these things. And while IgA is implicated, RSV, when it boils down to it, it appears to be IgG neutralization that ultimately... So, a lot of us don't really understand the major role of IgA. There are a lot of people walking around with IgA deficiency who don't seem to have any health problems. So the role of IgA isn't entirely clear. There are no vaccines optimized at the moment that make predominantly IgA. So mucosal B cells can make IgA or IgG, um, and the IgG can come out in your saliva or, or elsewhere. So the, the jury is out. I mean, and I didn't mention T cells. There are also some T cells that may be involved at the mucosal surface, but probably with targeted targets for, for proteins. But that's the answer about the mucosal IgA. A little bit controversial. Here. Yeah. Hi, okay. hi, David. Hi, hi, hi. How are you? Fine, how are you? Um, question. Is there any evidence that the pathogen, uh, that, that a pathogen specific um, protein makes a difference as the carrier? So, uh, GSK have tried this uh, with the pneumococcal vaccine, and they added in PhD and PhDE as carriers. They did an efficacy trial amongst the Navajo, uh, looking to see if you can have additional value to prevention of uh, carriage for serotypes that aren't in the vaccine. And unfortunately, all those serotypes, all, all those studies, that study was was didn't show any added value. There are many, many, many pneumococcal proteins that people have worked on for 30, 40, 50 years, which are beautiful immunogens in mice. They protect mice beautifully. The only problem is mice, uh, pneumococcus is not a natural pathogen for animals, apart apparently from some Icelandic horses and for us. And so the, the animal studies of all of these proteins have been very promising, and a number have got through to phase one 
even uh, usually phase one is where they stumble. A number of them have got through to phase one, and none of them work individually or, as GSK showed us in a very important study, they don't also work as carrier molecules. But we have this hope in the future that we will find a combination of proteins that can provide you with that nonspecific immunity so you don't get replacement disease, as we are getting now, plus have a capsule in them to give you, as you're hinting, the kind of primary response which you need, which is a capsule antibody. So it's the holy grail. It's what everybody wants but um, we haven't been able to find. So thanks. So, so this may be related to this. So, so you mentioned in, in the first one illustrating that, that this is B-cell mediated T-cell activation only. Are there any uh, signs, now you choose to use carriers that are that where we already have immunity towards yes. them. So are there any suggestions from some of the other studies here that, that that there is also an, an a dendritic cell activation yes. through the polycyrrhine. Yes, sure. We have tons of sure. cells or receptors sure. that recognize sure. these. Yes, I've been criticized before, in fact, at ADVAC, for not having the dendritic cells on the slide. Um, but because I always talk after lunch, uh, my feeling was that dendritic cells would put everybody to sleep. But you're absolutely right that dendritic cells are an intrinsic part of antigen presentation. Many groups have fed them. Uh, 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 conjugate vaccines and they kill can present, but they also pull together because of FC receptors. They pull together. They bring the antibody down, holding the pneumococcal polysaccharide and the T cell. They bring them together and, and help that interaction. So they are, they are important. And, and just to follow up. So, so, so the polysaccharides, are there any suggestions whether some polysaccharides act better at stimulating the dendritic cells, activating the dendritic cells than others? Well, most of the data suggests that the polysaccharide on their own is not enough of a stimulus for the dendritic cells. So when we grew dendritic cells in the lab and fed them polysaccharides, nothing happened. What we had to do was we had to stimulate them first with LPS. And once we matured them with LPS, that signal allowed us to. So, so that, that remains the problem. But with these vaccines, they aren't adjuvanted, but I think there's probably enough second signal there to get the dendritic cells working. So I suppose the reason I highlight B cells on this slide is because most people think of dendritic cells as the professional antigen-presenting cells, and they don't think of B cells as APCs, but actually B cells are powerful APCs. But you're absolutely correct. If the cartoon was anatomically correct, there would be a dendritic cell there. Any other questions? Yes, raise it. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned that we have about 100 uh, subtypes of uh, pneumonia. Yeah. So we have different types of vaccines, 7 valent, 10 valent, 13 valent, and now 23 valent. What do you think about the serotype coverage and variability? And so uh, how uh, this company should focus on strains that cover all the subtypes? So I think um, Ron and Keith are going to cover that in, in their talk, because they're going to talk about you know, the problems we have at the moment with NUMA and how we can address them. And, th and that, that question is directly relevant to their talk. So I'm sure they will address it. If not, please ask the question again at the end of their talk. Henry from Thailand. I, I would like to learn a little bit more about Crepsailar, which is like a very problematic on the AMR world. How, how, how is the vaccine development on Crepsailar comparing to other conjugate vaccines? So the Klebsiella is, is, as you say, it's very, very important for AMR. The problem with Klebsiella is that there are many, many, many capsular types. But what is more limited in Klebsiella is the O antigen. So they have a relatively limited number of O antigens. And there's a company uh, working on a, a quadrivalent O antigen vaccine, which would cover maybe 60 to 70% of all the Klebsiella that cause AMR. If you wanted to get equivalent cover with the capsule, you're looking at about 20 different capsular polysaccharides of the Klebsiella. So at the moment, there's a great interest, and, and, and um, uh, the Gates Foundation is uh, funding a, a lot of work on understanding whether we could move with either a Klebsiella capsular conjugate or if we could move with a Klebsiella O antigen conjugate. That O antigen conjugate has just finished a phase one study, and it remains to be seen if that is taken forward.